So who was it then that replaced or possibly mixed with these, uh, these Neanderthals and these other archaic uh, uh, forms? What is this AMH thing that I keep talking about? Um, AMH stands for anatomically modern human, and that is effectively someone just like us, someone within the range of human variation or pretty close to the range of human variation that we have for all living people today. They are Homo sapiens, but they are more specifically the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens. They are absolutely, effectively um, us. Um, they originated, uh, we, uh, as we said, probably in Africa, probably in East Africa. The earliest evidence we have for it often actually comes from a site in Southern Africa. Um, we have good reason to believe that they were popping up here, or sort of this part here first. Um, uh, just so, uh, since I don't think we had a slide with the, uh, the countries of I East Africa mapped on them uh, for a while. This is the sort of Great Rift Valley that I'm talking about here on the east side of Africa. Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, um, and there's Lake Malawi. Um, so all sort of up and down here. That is a good spot to go looking for our ancestors because the earth is starting to actually pull slowly apart there, and that it's just regular geologic processes. Um, the tectonic plate of Somalia and Ethiopia and this part of it is sort of pulling off into the, to the Indian Ocean and is going to be an island in a few million years. But at the moment, it's just sort of pulling things open and we get access to these older layers of, um, of sediment where the ancestors that we are, thinks, are looking for are, are buried. Um, down here, all the way at the tip of Africa, is a site called Classy's River Mouth, which is one of the, the sort of famous sites uh, that gives us a lot of depth of information about what these folks were like uh, 120, 130,000 years ago when anatomically modern humans first seemed to, to, to jump onto the scene. Um, Classy's River Mouth is a, um, this is a kind of fuzzy black and white image, but it's a set of caves. The dark spots here are caves. Um, and you can see right there at the front of it, this uh, little white foam there is as breakers of the oceans of, uh, uh, off the southern tip of Africa um, breaking onto the shore. And um, you can see right here uh, a sort of a, a schematic view of, of what this area looks like. So we have a river, the Classies River, that comes out of, uh, of South Africa into the um, uh, the ocean here, and a series of caves, and they're just numbered cave one, two, three, four, five, uh, sets of small beaches, beachheads there, and um, sort of mud flats and rock shelves that are exposed at low water. Um, the, the, the reason we think this site is, uh, uh, was occupied for so long and so often in, in the sort of deep antiquity that we're talking about is that it is really the perfect location to be uh, a pre-modern hunter-gatherer. It is a spot where you could, you could pretty much live in these caves and never have to go anywhere. Most uh, hunter-gatherer populations, most anatomically modern humans, and for all, almost all of our history, have been gatherer-hunters. We we've gathered food that the world was going to produce anyway and hunted animals. Um, in generally, populations that have done that have had to move around the landscape, and that's because the carrying capacity for any given spot of Earth is not really going to be uh, that high for human beings. We're top-level predators. We take a lot of fuel to, to feed these big hunks of fat up here that are, are really making us um, so adaptive, uh, our brains. We need a lot of resources, and most small human groups are going to eat all the food available in, a, in any given spot of ground relatively quickly. <laughs> At Classy's Rivermouth, you actually could probably stay there pretty much all year round, sitting in the caves, going out and collecting uh, whatever is uh, shellfish available on these rock shelves, fishing, if you could fish uh, uh, animals off the, the water here. You've got fresh water always coming in from the Classy's River. Uh, you've got all the fresh water resources and mud flats here, and of course you've got game and animals that would be hunted inland and wild resources that you could collect inland too. So you're really at the best spot. Fresh water, sea, salt water, sea resources, and, um, and land resources all at the same spot. Classy's River Mouth was occupied uh, from, um, uh, about, uh, for about s at least 60,000 years. Uh, from about 120,000 years ago until about 60,000 years ago. That is one of the longest records of, uh, of human occupation in the same spot that we've got anywhere in the world. This was a great spot to set up shop, and so people did. Um,
And as I mentioned, you know, a few lectures ago, people are messy, and whenever they go anywhere, they leave behind a bunch of junk. Uh, at this site, these caves, um, we actually have in spots up to about uh, 65 feet of deposits layered on top of each other, layer upon layer upon layer, you know, something like 20 meters of, um, uh, of stuff, you know, as tall as this building that is just the, the detritus that was jump, dumped by, uh, by, by people and then you know, layers of, of naturally occurring soils occasionally interspersed, but a huge long sequence of, uh, of finds and of habitation at this place. What do we actually find when we're looking there? Well, um, we have some things that are sort of to be expected, right? You've got um, uh, shellfish, you've got uh, bones of animals, they were eating seals, they were eating whales. We don't think probably that they were, you know, whaling, that they were going out in boats and, uh, and whaling. Certainly 120,000 years ago, um, it, is, it is probable, um, it would generally be argued that they did not have boat technology, at least not, you know, seafaring boat technology. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, most likely they were eating some of these animals that were washing up on the, so the shore or the seals that were resting on the shore, you know, uh, if, you, if you're really hungry and you're in a place where there are seals, they come to shore very tired from a lot of swimming for months on end, and you can really walk up to one and whack them on the head, and you can eat for a good long while based on a, a seal. Not that I'm advocating seal clubbing. Um, freshwater resources like, uh, um, and freshwater, uh, and, and land mammals too. We got a lot of land mammals, which we'll talk about in just a second. One thing that really gets a lot of attention are these finds that you're looking at here. And these are human remains. Um, we, we, we have human remains in a number of different ways, um, but this is sort of how we know that we're dealing with anatomically modern human. We're looking at at least five partial mandibles, this part here, uh, now the lower part of your jaw. Um, and, uh, and maxillas, upper part of your jaw, facial bones. Uh, teeth, we've got some cranial fragments, a few postcranial bones, bits and pieces, basically. We're not looking at burials, like the ones we've seen, we saw at Shanadar or the Neanderthals. And remember, we're now sort of going back in time here, right? The Neanderthals at Shanadar were something like 40, 70,000 years ago. Some of these finds, at least, are, are older than that, 100,000 years ago. Um, the other th interesting thing about these, and this is a little bit washed out on this slide, but you, know, you can sort of see it on this one, is that some of these bones are, uh, are burned on small spots here in the end, there, right there. Remember, we're in a cave. Um, and there also is an indication that some of these bones have been sort of broken up. So, you know, what's the, so the, fine, the argument you might build from that? Good guess that we are a cremation, uh, looking at a cremation burial. Based on what I just said, you might be willing to, to, to believe that. Um, most of the bones weren't burned, though. Just small parts of some of the bones. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Cannibalism is the, is the sort of sexy, exciting news story that is going to be written out of this, you know. Proof that our ancient, an ancient ancestors were man-eaters, right? It has to be man, right? They're always sexist about that. Um, I imagine that there was equal opportunity uh, uh, eating of, of, of ancient peoples. Um, you know, we, we definitely have evidence that cannibalism is a part of our species history. It is certainly something that we talk about more uh, or out of proportion, I think, to how often it happened. Um, this is not an open and shut case, but it's certainly an argument, right? Um, it's something that, that uh, might, might, explain, um, might explain what we're looking at there. We found, like I said, a lot of other animals besides human beings, and you don't obviously need to know uh, the differences here between different phases of this site or the different animals. Um, I'm, I think you have to be really familiar with South African fauna to know the difference between what each of these different uh, little shapes are. Uh, at least they have the, the names uh, there. These different, different animals, most of them are kind of deer-like, kind of buffalo-like, kind of along those type of animal. Um, what might we learn from uh, about ancient peoples by looking at this kind of evidence, this faunal archaeology or zooarchaeology? Could be also seen as what they preferred to eat. Great. So there's definitely going to be a, a, um, a combination of factors that are going into what they're eating. So obviously these are representing the food that these guys are, are, are eating, right? And there's questions that you then ask about that. How did they get it? And, and what other factors are, are influencing that process, like what's what's tasty, right? Or at least what's possible, what's practical. Um, 
this is why uh, some folks spend a lot of time becoming faunal archaeologists, re learning to recognize all the little tiny, not only just the, what the different bones are, but uh, the different bones in different species, and then the different bones in different species at different life stages, right? Are we talking about an old springbok, or are we talking about um, a, a young springbok? Are we talking about a, a, a blue antelope that is, uh, is sick, or one that is you know, healthy and in the prime of life? And what we can do with this data is talk actually a lot about how these people were living because a large chunk of their daily life was probably consumed by getting the food they needed to survive, right? By getting, by, by economy. And what um, uh, zooarchaeologists do is they can actually, um, they can distinguish just sort of in rough outline um, between sort of two big patterns that one might look at. And in, in reality, there are often shades of gray, but you can certainly make some statements about how uh, these food, food was acquired based on, on this question. You could look at uh, two kinds of, recognize two patterns in, uh, in animal uh, resource acquisition. Uh, you could look at a catastrophic kill pattern or you could find an attritional kill pattern. Um, are we talking about the animals that uh, are being selected for being eaten? Were they acquired in a catastrophic moment or through attrition? Um, a catastrophe is something that we all hear about as a, as a, a bad thing right now. That hurricane is a catastrophe. Um, but in, in terms of whether zooarchaeology, uh, uh, where we can talk about how things are coming to a site through zooarchaeology, a catastrophic kill pattern is going to be something that, um, uh, a, a process of acquiring animals that uh, works equally on all members of the animal group. So basically, you've got a whole herd of springbok running around South Africa, and they're going to be baby springboks and really, really old springboks on their last legs. There's going to be healthy, you know, strong ones, and there's going to be uh, weaker, sick ones in any given herd. And if you look at the, um, uh, the animals that are being represented at a site, like Classy's Rivermouth, and you find exactly that, whole groups, little babies, old, uh, old springboks, um, uh, sick ones, healthy ones, then you know that they're probably being killed in one big event that applies to all members of that herd equally. So for example, um, I mentioned fire a few classes ago. Fire is a great thing for scaring animals like this. They avoid it very carefully. Um, if you are an ancient uh, uh, hunter group, you can get a bunch of people arranged around, you know, spread out great distances around uh, a, um, a herd of, of these animals. You all light up your torches at, your, 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 uh, at the same time, or you set a small brush fire nearby. It's going to scare them all uh, in a certain direction. And maybe you scare them all towards a big cliff, and they all run over the cliff. And well, they're either dead already, or you can just walk down there at your leisure, and they've all gotten their, sorry, animal rights activists, but they're all, their bones are all broken, and they're lying there, and you can just you know, whack them in the head uh, and, and take what you need. That's going to represent one pattern in the faunal remains. That's going to give you one pattern in the faunal remains. Another option is that you might actually uh, hunt animals sort of one on one. Uh, you might kill them in a one off, right? And that's going to give you a different pattern. You're not going to kill a whole group together because you're going to kill one, and when the others see that, they're going to run away. You're not going to get all the other ones. This is a, 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 an attritional kill pattern. We hear about the phrase a war of attrition, um, and it's sort of come to mean something different than what the actual word means. When you hear about people saying it's a war of attrition, I think about like it's a really mean, nasty war where they're really trying to, 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 to get each other. It's, you know, it's, I mean, I'm not sure what a nice war would be as a comparative, but you know, apparently it's like a war that is extra bad. Um, the original meaning of the word is actually uh, sort of, uh, 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 in, in this case, something about um, uh, working more slowly on a one-on-one -on -one uh, cases. So, you know, a war of attrition in, in human terms would be something like a guerrilla war, where uh, guerrillas, you know, folks would, would come in and, and kill one or two people at a camp and then run away, and then come back three weeks later and do the same thing. They're just getting a little bit at a time, regularly, over time. Uh, an attritional kill pattern with animals being hunted would look really different than a catastrophic kill pattern. What's it likely to look like? What would an attritional kill pattern look like in the bones? Yeah. Yeah, that would be one example. If they're really old or young, those are the 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 the, the springbok or whatever animal that are going to be probably the easiest to kill to pick off. You separate them from the herd, just like wolves do, right? Humans do the exact same thing. Those are the ones that are going to fall behind. 
they're going to be the ones that you can sort of single out. Because, you know, Springbok don't have a lot of weapons like lion's claws they can kill you with, but if you're one lone human standing in the middle of a herd of very angry, you know, horse-sized deer, that could be a bad place for you, right? They're going to be able to get rid of you, make you not a threat even if you've got a, a, a couple of stone points and, and clubs and things. But you can separate one off from the herd, scare the rest away, and get that one. And so you're going to have other selective factors, is how it's put on the screen here, that, that there are other factors involved in selecting which animals are being killed and eaten besides just they were there as the herd was. So the old, the young, the sick are going to be higher, represented more in, uh, in those finds than, um, than the sort of mid-aged, healthiest animals. So here's an example from Classy's Rivermouth. What do we actually find? Uh, we find a fair number of these suckers. These are eland. Um, they are sort of, I mean, you know, they look a little bit like a cross between a cow and a buffalo and a deer, and, and you know, they're all sort of related to each other. They're, um, uh, they're pretty large. Uh, they're, they're, they're up two and three meters tall, so you know the tops of these horns can be about nine feet tall, the height of this room. Right? This, is, this is a pretty large animal. Um, they're actually the largest species of antelope, technically. They're, they're part of the antelope family. But they are um, really pretty mellow as animals go. They're very docile. They're um, really easily frightened. And when they're frightened, they're not going to attack you. They're going to turn and run as fast as they can, which is reasonably fast for something quite as big as they are. Um, we find about 80 examples of these at Classy's River Mouth, and the kill pattern we're looking at here is catastrophic. Uh, it looks like probably these animals were basically scared over a cliff or scared into a ravine where they could sort of be weighted out um, <coughs> or exhausted um, because, you know, even you know, they're docile, you don't want to get up close with one of these if you don't have to. You would be much happier scaring it over a cliff and then picking up what was left later on. Over time, remember we have at, at, at Classy's Rivermouth a long sequence of 60,000 years of occupation, and we have these in nice, nice stratigraphic layers, perfect archaeological way of talking about change over time, right? Each layer is going to be newer than the one underneath it. Over time, we find slightly less and less of the eland going through at this site. Now, eland is a really nice thing to hunt and eat, but they're, um, they're an animal that ranges really far. And there are times of the year where you're just not going to find eland naturally in the southern tip of Africa near, uh, near Classy's River Mouth. So when they're there, and you can happen to catch a herd in the right spot between you and a cliff, and you can you know, get your, your people in spot and scare them off that cliff, you're in good shape. You've got all the food you need for a long time, but they're hard to get in that in that, uh, in that spot, right? Um, they're not actually there for a lot of the year. So we think probably over time they were spending less time doing this and more time with something else. This might be one of the something else's. Um, this is a Cape buffalo. Uh, and, you know, it, it's actually a, it's a much smaller animal than an eland. Um, you, know, it's about, you know, they're still quite large to you and me. Um, let's see, do I have exactly how big they are? About, about 1.7 meters tall, so basically as tall as I am here. Um, you know, I guarantee you this guy's a lot stronger than I am, um, and you would rather pick a fight with me than with him. Please don't do either. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, about my size. Um, but they are really kind of mean. They're, you know, not to, not to put bias on, uh, to, to judge the, a wild animal for acting as its instincts tell it to, they're going to fight back if they're cornered. If they are, um, you, know, you know, maybe they could run away, but maybe they're going to choose to not bother to run away. Maybe they're going to actually get fight with somebody when they're confronted. Um, they don't herd. They run across. Uh, they, they run uh, in, uh, by themselves a lot of the time. So they're not going to be an animal that you can effectively scare over a cliff and pick up at your own leisure. We have relatively few, uh, fewer of these compared to Classy's River Mouth. At least 30 or so of these uh, were found, 29 were found at Classy's River Mouth. But we think that there is a little bit more emphasis on the Cape Buffalo over time. So over time, they're getting slightly fewer of these, kind of hard to find, but relatively easy to hunt. And over time, they're getting relatively more of these, which are all over the place down there, or certainly they were pre-modern. So they're easy to find, but they're more difficult to hunt. 
And we actually think what we're looking at here is um, a, a, a change towards uh, increased um, uh, technology in, uh, in hunting ability. That these, these, these hunters are actually becoming uh, better hunters over that chunk of time from 120 to about 60,000 years ago. Um, this is a, a question that we talked about a while back. We actually asked, you know, are, are uh, Homo habilis, these early hominin ancestors, early genus Homo ancestors, so 2.5, 2.6 million years ago, are these um, critters hunting the animals that they eat or are they scavenging them? And we, we certainly felt at the time that there was still an awful lot of scavenged sort of um, you know, rotting zebra meat that they don't need to cut off the bone. That just happens to be what the lions have left over. Now, we're jumping way far into the future here, you know, 2.4 uh, million years or so. Um, so it's not like I'm suggesting uh, a, a direct connection between the two. But I wanted to make the point here that we're now at these, these fully modern, anatomically modern humans, we are kind of dealing with, um, with great hunters. That certainly over time, um, from 120 to 60,000 years ago, their technology and their ability to hunt uh, definitely increased and that they learned how to get uh, uh, more Cape buffalo, which were harder to come by than, uh, than, than the eland. I like the far side. If you can't read the bottom, it says, uh, buffalo breath, buffalo breath, shall we discuss your incessant little grinding noises, or grunting noises? And, you know, the hunter's looking for the Cape Buffalo there in the back. No? Nothing? Thanks. I don't need your pity laugh. Now here's just a, just a real quick comparison, you know, um, between this site and another site I won't really talk too much about is Nelson's Bay, this top line here. What you're looking at is a graph that's representing, um, you know, comparison, how much of each of these critters are showing up in these sites. And Nelson's Bay is a much, much more recent site. It's about 10,000 years uh, ago versus Classy's River Mouth from 120 to 160,000 years ago. And you can really see here, um, you know, the, the, the trend, if you sort of look more broadly, not just in Classy's River mouth itself, but compare it to other sites nearby. Percentage-wise, you know, they're, they're getting an awful lot of eland here um, uh, as the, the, the animal that they're eating, which is harder to come by and harder to hunt in, in terms of, um, uh, of, of seasonality and things like that, but easier to hunt in terms of once you've got one, how do you actually bring it down and make sure you can eat it? Uh, and then much less of that later on here in this Nelson's Bay site where they're hunting very effectively Cape Buffalo, Bush Pig, another kind of smaller but, but really tough um, animal that you wouldn't really want to tangle with um, if you could, uh, could avoid it. So we're definitely seeing um, through the faunal remains at these, uh, these, ancient, these really early uh, uh, um, uh, South, Aus South African sites of, uh, connected to anatomically modern humans, we're seeing the development of uh, a really modern ability to hunt, right? Their, their, their technology, their techniques for hunting are uh, improving. What are they doing to improve? Well, here's one thing that may be part of that. Where we really started was uh, with an observation. Uh, that humans are amazingly good throwers uh, and we can throw both with incredible accuracy and incredible velocity uh, and people have noticed for years that humans are amazing throwers if you look at any professional baseball player or cricket bowler they can throw 90 to 100 miles an hour many times over and over again during a single game but really i think the most amazing thing is what normal people can do uh, so if you look at sort of any uh, little league baseball game in any town in america you can find a 12 or 13 year old kid that can throw 60 or 70 miles per hour. Uh, and that to me is really remarkable performance. That ability comes into better focus when you consider what chimpanzees who are our closest uh, living relatives can do in terms of throwing performance. Chimpanzees are really athletic. They're very strong. They can lift hundreds of pounds. They can run essentially right up a tree, but adult males can only throw about 20 miles per hour, which is about a third of as fast as a, you know, a 12 or 13 year old boy. Why is it and how is it that humans are so good at throwing? When did that occur? It must have occurred sometime during our evolution that we became really good at throwing. Uh, and probably arguably most important, why? What we started to look at was the mechanics of how someone throws a, an object, a projectile, a ball. The really remarkable thing that humans do is they store energy in their shoulders. Uh, and a sort of good analogy for, for how that storage occurs is a slingshot. So with a slingshot, you pull really hard on those elastic bands that store energy in that slingshot. And you're doing the same thing with your shoulder. Uh, when you're actually throwing, you're rotating your shoulder back, right? And you're, you're essentially stretching the elastic bands that are your tendons and your ligaments in your shoulder. Uh, and those store energy. And then just like a slingshot, when you release, 
that slingshot, that elastic energy is returned and it allows you to really accelerate uh, an object such as a rock forward and that's the same thing that's happening with our arm. And we studied that in some collegiate baseball players who we had in our lab and we stuck reflective markers on their arms and their torsos and we recorded how they moved in three dimensions. But what you'll see is that as the arm is sort of rotated back, that's when we think that elastic energy is being stored. Uh, and then the arm is rapidly rotating forward. A number of changes that have occurred during our evolutionary past to the shoulder and the arm uh, and the torso really um, make this elastic energy storage possible. And those changes occurred around two million years ago. We see hunting behavior emerge around that time. So the earliest evidence of hunting in terms of bones that were butchered uh, and things of that nature appear around two million years ago synchronous with this behavior. We think that throwing was probably most important early on in terms of uh, hunting behavior and enabling our ancestors to effectively kill big game and, and get more calories for their diet. Uh, and why is that important? Why, is, why does hunting matter? Uh, hunting probably matters because more calories in your diet means you can build bigger bodies and bigger brains and have more babies. Uh, all of the things that matter for evolution. The interesting thing about the way that we threw in the past versus the way that we throw now uh, is that there are very few people that throw to hunt anymore. Mostly the way people throw today is during sports, right? Uh, and the remarkable thing about sports is that you're throwing using this incredible ability, but you're doing it hundreds of times in a couple of hours. And that wasn't the case uh, for how we would have been throwing uh, when, when we were evolving and using this to hunt. Uh, so this re remarkable ability, which we were evolved to do, doesn't really sync up with the modern usage. And what happens is that people actually injure their shoulders and they injure their elbows. So at the end of the day, the ability that we have to store elastic energy in our shoulder makes us great throwers, but it's also injuring us. There are a number of things that we're doing to follow this research up. One of the things that we're doing is actually looking at what early projectiles actually were. So we know that throwing probably evolved around two million years ago, or at least the capacity for throwing. But we don't see evidence of projectiles in, in the archaeological record for about a million and a half years. So what was it that we were throwing, and how is it that we were killing uh, these animals? And one way that we can start to look at that is to look at the killing capacity of, of things such as sharpened wooden spears, right? What happens if you try to kill something with a just a sharpened wooden stick? Uh, can you do it? How much energy is required? Can individuals actually throw these things effectively and use them to hunt, and that's what we're looking at next.